Okay, we're starting the recording now. Okay, John, we'll get started. Okay, great. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. I'm Tony Ross, the Director of Communications at Provalis Research. Before we get to today's presentation, I uh, want to do a little, I, I want to tell you about our next event, which is taking place on Wednesday, February the 8th at 12 noon Eastern time. It's titled Using Computer Learning Tools to Compare Media Content. The presentation is being hosted by Dr. Abby Jones and Dr. Sarah Oates. It focuses on a project using QDA Minor as well as other computer assisted learning tools to discover how Russian propaganda narratives resonated in the US news during the 2020 elections. Primarily, the project focuses on Russia phobia, a concept pushed by the Russians stating that Americans unfairly denigrate and fear Russia. You can register for the webinar, which is, of course, free on the webinar section of the Provalis uh, Research website. Now to today's presentation. It's titled Uncovering Propaganda, Deception, and Bias in Media Reporting, Using Text Analytics as a Scientific Tool for Automatic Detection. The presentation will look at the exponential growth of social media and news reporting over the internet that has made text analytics an essential tool for sound decision making. In this regard, an important challenge becomes how to combine science with text analytics to reliably separate truth from propaganda, deception, and bias. This Lunch and Learn is the first in a three-part series that explores this challenge and provides a suggested framework for automatic detection using WordStat and complementary statistical software tools and techniques. Dr. John Aaron is our presenter. John has a PhD in economics and is a 26 year veteran of project management and a data science consultant. Since 1995, John has served in a variety of organizations as a contract project manager and as a software solutions provider, specializing in enterprise project management, business transformation, project stakeholder decision making, project leadership, project management, machine learning, and project management data analytics, SAP ERP implementation, project management, CRM, IT infrastructure, and data analytics. I will now turn the presentation over to John. But just before you start, John, please, everybody who's here, please uh, stay on mute and, and um, close your video. Just makes it less distracting. I will be doing that too during the presentation. At the end of the presentation, when John is finished, we will take questions and we'll take them through the, through the chat feature. Okay, thank you very much, John. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Uh, it's, it's good to be back with uh, uh, my colleagues at Provalis. And uh, it's, uh, I think, a very interesting topic uh, and, and certainly one that uh, is, uh, has a lot of interest. Uh, I, Tony kind of read uh, everything that uh, is, is there. The only thing, uh, th this session, I will, I will talk to uh, to the top of the hour. So I'll probably go for 60 minutes and then we have some discussion. I'll, I'll try and finish it slightly earlier than that. But given a little bit extra time, I'm adding two case studies rather than just one. And I think Tony did a good job of, of basically describing what we're, what we're talking about. Uh, so if you're in the right uh, topic area, then please stay with us and we're going to go through all this. So again, I want to emphasize this is the first of a three-part series. So this, this one is I'm, I'm kind of providing a foundation uh, and I'm taking more of a macro view, whereas in later ones, we're gonna deal with specific micro examples and so on, although we will get into some of that today uh, as, as well. So um, one of the things to think about uh, in terms of relevance to you uh, is that this presentation talks uh, has a perspective of individual personal decision-making. Uh, we're never, going to stop propaganda, right? I mean, it's in advertising. It's been around this really since World War I and it's become um, um, quite refined since then. But for individual decision-making, uh, it answers questions like, should I believe the mass media? Should I believe authority figures? Whom should I believe in social media? Whom should I support and donate time and money to? 
Should I trust resumes I receive? Should I trust student papers? Should I believe claims made on websites? And can I spot text written by bots or AI? So by the time we get through the third workshop, we're gonna get into kind of all these different types of propaganda, deception, bias, et cetera. Um, and uh, my, my goal really is to really give, give you the tools so that you can do this on your own using you know, the very fine tools that uh, the Provalis Research Company has provided, as well as some of the, the uh, uh, statistical tools that go along with these. And so you'll see how I approach problems. And my hope is that you'll be able to say, oh, that's the way this person is approaching it. I can do similar things on my own. So that's really uh, my, my goal for this. So it relates also to personal decision-making. So basically the plan for the lunch and learns is that I'm going to assert eight propositions, three of which I'll cover today about techniques and capabilities to do this. And it's gonna be like peeling an onion. I'm gonna start at a very general level and describe a little bit about the sampling that I'm doing um, uh, and then moving in deeper and deeper into the approaches for uncovering uh, and dealing with these statistically uh, and, and also dealing with forensic science, linguistics, psychology, sociology. It's a very cross-disciplinary type of a, a problem to solve. And so, um, we're going to be asserting some propositions that build on each other. I'm going to give some demonstrations and show how these, these kind of work. And then ultimately to obtain feedback and engagement uh, from all of you. Um, and that's where we're going to spend the, the last 30 minutes today. Uh, and I, I hope we can kind of keep the questions at that part as well. But the ultimate goal is that uh, ideally that we say here, look, we have an automated detection method that gives us a probability of any document or any interview or any set of documents or whatever, that we have enough um, robustness in our process to be identifying some of the major methods on how we get deceived, right? I mean, that would be kind of a, a, a goal that we might have. And so the tools used, I'm gonna be using WordStat. That is, I'd say the main focus, the hub of the, all this. I'm also gonna be using the WordStat sentiment dictionary which is, turns out to be a very, very powerful uh, and useful tool that may be a new learning for everybody, <laughs> but uh, it is. And then um, that's gonna be the hub, but I'm also gonna be using, I use Minitab a lot, specifically with their controlled charts, machine learning, pattern recognition. And if we get into project management, they, they, they include that as well. But you're gonna see that woven into the things that I do where I export output from WordStat into Minitab to use their capabilities. I also use MATLAB, especially for text extraction from the web uh, and, and text disaggregation into time series. I also use their nonlinear curve fitting. In other areas besides text, I use MATLAB quite a bit for reinforcement learning or AI, but that isn't so much used here in the examples I'm showing. I also use the SCA B34S Scientific Computing Associates time series, and then of course, Excel. And I certainly want to express my thanks to all these organizations um, for help they've given me and continue to give me. It make, makes all this possible. Okay, let's get started. Uh, as kind of a, a general warm up, I wanna uh, talk about proposition one. And Proposition 1, according to me, asserts that text analytics of sampled topics, phrases, and words used in media can economically and accurately uncover realities about underlying processes across either a broad or narrow population. Now, this, you could argue, some people argue that economics determines propaganda in the first place. I'm not using this for that purpose, but what I'm using it for is to say, look, if we use careful sampling methods, and we use all the capabilities that's in, for instance, WordStat for topic modeling, phrase identification, as well as words, what we find is that we have the capability to really uncover hidden things and we can make inferences from those. And I wanna demonstrate that as a general example. And part of this is just to show you about my sampling method to familiarize you with how I drew a sample and that'll apply to the other examples that, I, that I'm that i going to demonstrate today. So our warm-up exercise is really going to be, can we demonstrate a representative sample of text that basically can be projectable to the overall economy, right, in some way? Can I come up with a sample like that? And so my approach is this. I essentially, every day since the end of August, have taken a daily sample 
of article titles from various websites. And there's under 10, uh, but they're balanced ideologically. I'll call it from the left, from the middle, and from the right, ideologically. And then I bring those, and each, each day I pull in a, about a text file of about 300 kilobytes. It's got about 40,000 words in it. And again, it's all titles. And I use MATLAB for that. And uh, thanks to their engineers, they very much gave me a lot of help in terms of making all this work. And uh, so we end up with this database. And, and I'm sure the state of the art will go beyond this, right? Like uh, Normand has in, in RSS feeds, and there's a lot of sophisticated methods. But for, for this kind of balancing so that I could control the sample itself to make sure that it was balanced and controlled daily, I have done this. And this morning, I ran it, and I continue to do this, right? So what happens is you end up pulling this information. You use topic modeling and WordStat. It's very, very good. I, I typically try to keep the weights using it. I'm trying to keep my own biases and prejudice out of this. So I try to go wherever possible using WordStat and all the assumptions built in its topic modeler. I put that into the dictionary. And what you end up with, with a framework like this, is a very, very sensitive uh, viewpoint of frequency, uh, either in word frequency or in ten, by frequency per 10,000 words, which I use both. And you get a very, very good insight as to what's happening on a daily basis. And so this is one of the tools that we use uh, to, to make all this work because we have different topics. And within each topic can be various types of bias, deception, or uh, um, you know, deceit. It's possible. And so it's all contextual in that regard. The other thing that uh, I'm going to be using uh, quite a bit today is the sentiment analysis uh, within the WordStat tool using the Provolis Research Sentiment Dictionary. Now, I've tried other dictionaries or sentiment uh, uh, lists, and I found it to be less effective than the one that Provolis provides. And I believe that part of that is explained by their use of proximity rules. I'm not sure. But all I can tell you is like, here's an example of negative words. You can see it was very constant. After the election, it kind of boosted up, you can see. But positive words turned out to be quite predictive. Uh, and there's enough variation, for instance, to say, hey, maybe we can test our sampling approach looking at economic variation. So the, fin the, the signals look faint, but they're not. Because if I look at the correlation between the positive words moving average, I take a five-day moving average, I normalize it, basically subtract from its mean, divide by a standard deviation, do the same for the Dow closing prices, what you see is a rather interesting correlation, right? And I'm doing this not to get us into a discussion of financial modeling. It's more validation. Do I am I am I operating a sampling method here that has some, some logic to it, some justification? And this can, tends to give me some comfort that yes, yes, it does. And uh, so if I take the samples coming in and I look at count of words, I got sentiment, I can go grab financial data or any other data that I want. And I can take a look at the topics, the phrases and the words. And in this case, it's a, some are frequency, some are frequency per 10,000. I end up with a very, very nice database that I can use internally into the WordStat tool or I can export it into other tools, right? And so if I was to do this and take a look at a mini tab controlled chart, what you see is positive words, right? And you'll see that I'm gonna be using this to, to measure bias, both positive and negative, is that I can see that there's values, but there's various stages of change that tend to occur. Like here's between Labor Day and the election, it was kind of low positive words, then it went up after, after the election but also take a look at the volatility. And all these are important predictors here. So if I was to take this and put this into a mini tab classification regression tree, think of it as just regression. And I was to look at, can I predict the Dow closing price? Well, I end up with a pretty high R squared, both for a training data set and a test data set. And the variables that tend to have the most behavior here are the positive word volatility, the positive word moving average, the Ukraine and Russian war word counts, the inflation word counts, and the Saudi oil production word counts, right? So all of a sudden we start to see this relationship between sentiment, topics, 
and some real world type of behavior, right? And so that gives a sense that, yeah, all right, uh, it, it starts to make, make some sense. And if I just quickly show this graphically using mini tabs uh, uh, graphs, this shows a, a the, the moving average normalize of the Dow to positive word um, sentiment by the moving average. If I look at also the moving standard deviation to the Dow, you can see that. Um, if I look at the VIX, the volatility index, which is kind of a negative correlation to the Dow, I can see the Ukraine-Russian war. I can also tie that to inflation words that's in these daily things. So you see the, the use of a daily sample, right? That's kind of where I'm, I'm heading with this. The daily samples, and when you control it and you try and keep it as constant and rigorous in your controls as possible, it can lead to some interesting things, right? So this one is the Saudi oil production. So um, very quickly, that was a warm up, right? Of just what sampling can do and how I use WordStat in, 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 in the, um, type of analyses I do for samples. So I use sentiment and I use uh, also the, the dictionary uh, for, for topics. And then sometimes I have custom topics, right? So for the next proposition, dealing with likelihood ratios. Now I'm starting to, to get more into this concept of deception. So likelihood ratios between a reference group of text and a target group of text for invest investigation enable us to test theories and hypotheses of deception using sequential observations. So to translate that to kind of plain English is I'm using a forensic science method of likelihood ratios. And I'm combining that with the ability to take these daily samples and using sequential analysis to test theories and hypotheses. And of course, the theories are either I have deception or I have no deception. Either I have a honest media or I have a controlled media. Either I have an honest person speaking or I have a person who's trying to deceive me in some way speaking. That's what a hypothesis is testing. It's always both sides. And I have to have a reference to do that, right? But I can use likelihood ratio. So let, let's go into this a little more. And again, we're, we're starting at a macro level and going down. By the time we have the third session, we're going to be very specific. But what we can say, for example, too, is we'll test for personal decision-making purposes, can we trust the mass media? And we'll see how we demonstrate this. And what we're going to do is that we're going to follow traditional science, which I linked to Karl Popper, Science Logic of Scientific Discovery, where basically you have a theory, you have competing hypotheses, either deceiving me or you're being honest. You run experiments and samples, you collect evidence, and then you basically try to dispute the evidence. You, you weigh, you, you try to falsify what you're doing. That's Karl Popper, right? The fact that you can't prove anything to be true, you can only refute it. And so we try and live with science in this kind of rigorous, call it old fashioned way uh, by, by using uh, likelihood ratios. And then once we get enough confidence that we think we have done enough, then we can go and we can automate this in some way. And then we have ourselves a useful tool. So that's kind of where it's going. So the goal is to improve the state of the art, but to have confidence in what we're testing using science and then deploy that using some type of automation. And you're gonna see that eventually I'm, I'm gonna move from likelihood ratios to machine learning types of predictions. But I'm starting with likelihood ratios. A um, Little bit on Popper. Uh, again, uh, this is the logic of scientific discovery. You can certainly look that up. It's, it's kind of a, a, a standard for setting science. It's my reference. And his premise was nothing can be proven true, only refuted by observation. You need confirming evidence and you try to falsify things, right? So this idea of like fact checkers and, and things of that nature where you have these loops where no one can argue with each other right? That's kind of out the window with Karl Popper, right? If we, if we take that approach. So let's move on and let's start with a theory though, right? We don't want to just grab things out of thin air. We're going to start with um, a theorist, Noam Chomsky, who's been around for a long, long time, criticizing the media and uh, showing that it's full of propaganda and, and his way, his view. He's, a, uh, he's very closely associated with the American ideological left, I would say. 
uh, very much against um, the concentration of wealth and power and his view that in fact, the media does nothing more than try and uh, concentrate that wealth and power further versus the average American or world citizen, right? And so um, he has this perspective that we have a controlled weaponized uh, reporting, untrustworthy reporting. The alternative to that would be it's honest and independent, but his perspectives in particular lead to two possible points of test. One is the manufacturing of consent and two, attacking solidarity. These, these would apply to the media, right? I mean, he also speaks to uh, uh, talking about um, uh, running the regulators and engineering elections and so on. I'm not gonna deal with that aspect of this theory. It's really the ones that lend itself to media. And in association with, with Chomsky, he's kind of backed up by another, another person, Juice Mirlu, who wrote uh, two books. Uh, he was, he was a, uh, uh, involved, he was a, a, a person from the Netherlands during the Nazi um, rule there in World War II. And he indicated that um, one of the roles of the media when you have a totalitarian state is that it tries to instill a sense of danger and fear. When you have fear in the population, it paralyzes the, the population not to resist, okay? And then this kind of goes along with uh, uh, Hermann Goring when he was in Nuremberg. And he said, and they asked him, well, how did you do it? And he said, uh, all the government really needs to do to turn people into slaves is fear. So you, if you find something to scare them, you can make them do anything you want, right? And uh, so if we add on to Chomsky and operationalize this a little bit with this idea of fear as part of our hypothesis, right? And then we go into a, a psychological framework. And again, I'm covering this very multidisciplinary because I think if we can establish this as a basis, it makes everything go much faster. But if we start out with Irv Janus and Leon Mann, who are psychologists, and I had a chance to work a little bit with Leon Mann before he, he left the university there down under. Um, but anyway, this is one of the most frequently cited uh, decision-making frameworks, that if we start out with this threat, uh, with an implied action and consent, according to Chomsky. So in other words, we have a 9-11 event, there's a danger. The response that we should be consenting to is the Patriot Act. Another threat is that we have a pandemic. That's the threat, that's the danger. The response is we have lockdowns, right? So it's things like that, that coming out of the media then, that drive that and imply that danger and that threat and so on. We internally ask ourselves questions when we have this, this type of presentation to us. Questions, are the risks serious if I don't change? Maybe or yes. If no, then I just change, right? And that's very low stress. We then go to, are the risks serious if I do change? Maybe or yes. If no, I just, I just, uh, you know, don't, don't bother changing, right? Uh, or I do change. Uh, then is it realistic to find a better solution? Is there sufficient time to deliberate? Each of these are progressively more and more vigilant steps we make. And so the goal is vigilance and, and we have to encounter a certain amount of moderate stress to do this. Now, the role of the media in propaganda right, is that what it tries to do is keep us from making vigilant decisions and kind of short circuit the process by convincing us to do things, right, or to go along with things that may not be in our best interest, but in the, in the propagandist's best interest, right? So that's kind of the, the following the Chomsky logic of, of what's being said here, right, and, and looking at it from a psychological perspective. So what, what Janice and Mann advocated was to make sure that when we're making a decision, we canvass all alternatives, we survey our objectives, we, we assess the plus and minuses of all risks, we search for relevant information, we challenge our choice, and we go from there. And so what happens then is that we, we, we tend to neutralize or have a countermeasure to propaganda, right, if we, if we can get ourselves to do this. And, and so one of the things we have to do, though, is to know it's being done to us. Right, and that and that and that is is part of our process of identification. And the other part of this is that one of the things that is so useful about this framework is that we can stay vigilant without having to prove causation. 
like one of the arguments in big tobacco, why, why you can't prove that, that smoking is not bad for you, is, is the argument, well, correlation is not causation. Well, decision-making doesn't care about that, right? Because it says, you just all you're doing is asking yourself internal questions. So that's the goal, is vigilance. And so what we wanna do then is, is, is to have this sense of vigilance. We wanna be able to identify and to properly evaluate information that we're given. And part of that is if people are trying to steer us wrongly, right? We get a flag for that and we can counter that and head towards vigilance. Now, the psychologists, and, and I have a bibliography that I've done a lot. I've probably done as much work on this as I have my own doctoral dissertation in 1987, um, because it's, it's very cross-disciplinary type of thing. But if you look at psychology and sociology, it's like um, we human beings, we can operate in two modes, kind of like the animal mode and then also the rational mode. And what happens is with, with propaganda, it kind of steers us away from the rational mode more towards the, the animal kind of mode. We have these, what are called vulnerabilities and, and propagandists tend to exploit that. So what they do in, in NET is they deliver information in a way that intentionally blocks vigilant decision-making. Okay, now enough background. And I, I, I really appreciate your tolerating my giving you that background as opposed to just jumping into the keystrokes of word staff. But I think you're gonna find that as a useful background there. So let's now go into my sample and see if we can validate or, or dis or unvalidate Chomsky's premise, right? We have two hypotheses. One is normal, honest media. Two is that it is kind of controlled, biased, right? And if it's biased, it's probably following that old tried and true method of creating fear and steering us in a certain way, right? Well, if I compare my samples, my daily samples, to the American national corpus, what I find is this. If I take all the samples coming out of the corpus, and that exists, if you look it up, you'll see it's a great document to, to base things on. And what I find is on the terms of negativity, remember I'm looking at sentiment, both positive words and negative words. And if I look at the balance of the two towards negativity as it goes up, what I see is that it's way high on the negative samples that's in the corpus. And in fact, it's very close to the FBI terrorist documentation, right? Pretty high tense, intense stuff just coming out of titles that are coming every day, right? So that's one ex way of viewing it. Another way of viewing it is to looking at negativity right, which is related to the relationship between number of negative words and number of positive words. If I compare the corpus as a probability distribution, right here, I see this, I hear this sense, and I see it negative wise, it's pretty close like to 50-50, but if I consider the negative words coming out of the, the daily samples of media, it's way skewed to the right, to the negative, right? Well, how do you test this as a, as a scientific hypothesis using these likelihood ratios. And what are likelihoods, right? Well, uh, keep in mind, critical thing here is we have this reference that we're dealing with. That's very important. We just don't make observations about, about the sample we have. We have to have some kind of a reference. And so if I use the work of the forensic scientists, which basically have taken um, a lot of Bayesian type of framework, and uh, looking at that, likelihood ratios are very much a Bayesian way of thinking. But if I take that, what they do is this. Let's say you have a distribution uh, of honest, kind of similar to what I just showed you between the uh, corpus and, and what I was seeing from the, from the sample of media. Let's just take this example. If I take these and I look at these on, on the density and I sample these, these heights, those are likelihoods. Right, And if I compare the two, let's say I get an observation where it's about 85% negative, say, something, or 85 words, whatever, and I compare it to the hypothesis that it's honest versus to the hypothesis that it is deception, you see the gap here. And the greater the gap, the greater the what is called the weight of evidence. And if I take a daily weight of evidence and I basically construct it so that I can add it all up, because Bayes' theorem is multiplying, but if I take logs of things, I can add them up. 
And then I accumulate that over time and I use Alan Turing's plausibility method. Now Turing did all this breaking Enigma code and Tunney code in World War II with I.J. Good, and he came up with this scheme basically to say, look, if you get a decibel rating coming out of this, greater than 20, it's decisive, right? And 15 to 20 is strong. And well, this is hypothesis testing. This is basically how they broke the Enigma code, right? Using Bayes' theorem the same way. We're doing it exactly what they're doing, and that's what forensic scientists use today. So if I take this, and again, I can use both continuous distributions, or I can take odds ratios using uh, discrete distributions, such as the binomial, all right? And you know, I'm, I'm kind of going through this fast because I want you to get the big picture, not the nitty gritty of every little calculation here, okay? But if I take this now, and I look at my sample, and I take this and I use a distribution that is perfectly applied to it, which is in this case is the beta distribution, where I can take negative words, positive words, and look at their relationship, negative to positive, And I compute this, this kind of weight of evidence, daily weight of evidence, and I add it all up, I end up with something like this that says, look, here's my sample. And if I take this, this metric of weight of evidence, and I see in about a week, I had enough evidence to tell me that it was decisively negative, okay? Way out of, way out of bounds there. And it supports the hypothesis of Mirlu and Chomsky in that regard, okay? So that's how I operationalize that. Now, am I, am I advocating that I'm the only way, this is the only way to do it? No, of course not. The purpose of this exercise is to show you how I did it. Perhaps you would come up with a different way of doing it, but it is clearly following science because I'm taking a, hypo a theory, I'm taking a hypothesis, I'm getting samples and I'm testing it, and I'm looking for significance. In this case, significance is a Bayesian is different than a, than a frequentist would be, right? Because a Bayesian is converting this plausibility measure to decision-making, right? And that's, that's what's so attractive about using Bayes' theorem in this, gar, in this regard, as opposed to the traditional frequentist type of, of approach where you're just looking at probabilities and curves and t-values and z-values and so on, right? So that's, that's kind of the, the, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this is to say, Look, there's, there's a way that you don't have to get hung up in, in causation and correlation arguments because you're mapping this to decision making. That's now you see why I showed you the Janus and Mann model, right? Because all you have to do is say maybe or yes. And once you hit those thresholds, these established thresholds, you've got enough to say it is decisive statistically. And that gives you a trigger point to say, wait a minute, we have uncovered something. And this is a way and a method that can be applied not just at the total mass media that I'm doing in this case, but it can be applied to specific interviews, to specific documents, to web channels, to whatever you want to do, right? It applies. So now where it comes from, the history of this, this kind of Bayes factors, likelihood ratios, and uh, it uses a term called inverse probability that I'll explain quickly, but I think importantly, is that it started with Charles Peirce in the 1870s, then Harold Jeffries in the 30s, then Alan Turing in the 40s, and I.J. Good worked for Turing, but then he went on in the 50s through the 70s and wrote a lot on this, and this is what forensic scientists tend to use. Now, similarly, Bayes' theorem has been used quite a bit. For instance, if you go into WordStat, the machine learning in there is naive Bayes, right? And Bayes has, has traditionally been associated with word analysis. But it's also used, likelihood ratios are used with logistic regression and uh, dealing with odds and so on like that. So there's a, there's a real strong framework uh, for this that, that goes back quite a ways. And you'll sometimes hear this word using inverse probability. What does that mean? Well, most of us are trained in deductive reasoning, deduction. It's kind of like if A is true, then B is true. 
if A is true, therefore B is true. Now, how would that play out? Well, let's say we have a premise that all men have deep voices. John is a man, therefore John has a deep voice. Now, there's not much you can do with that, okay? Deduction, even though it's advertised in Sherlock Holmes and all that as being the thing he uses, it's really closer to what I'll call induction. Because induction is saying, if A is true, then B is true. I know B is true. Now, what can I say about A? So in other words, I hear a deep voice. That's my sample. That's my evidence. How likely is it that it's a man? Well, I only get that through samples. And the more samples, the greater the plausibility. And that's why it's called inverse probability as opposed to these, this deduction. So you'll sometimes hear that term, okay? And this is from Ed Jaynes in 1958. So the other thing that Jaynes talked about this approach, and this is why the forensic scientists like it so much, is that it, the approach of likelihoods associates plausibilities with real numbers. It gives a qualitative correspondence with human common sense. It's consistent, and I'm adding, it avoids hedging because correlation does not prove causation. The big tobacco example, right? Because what we're dealing with is human decision-making. That's the ultimate objective, as far as I'm concerned, is that people make good, vigilant decisions. It doesn't matter what the decision is, as far as I'm concerned. It, it could be anything, but as long as it's done in vigilance, then I think, then I think we all function well, right? And so this, this kind of avoids that red herring that you sometimes hear, okay? So if I look at the, the what was uncovered, if in fact I did a good job and I had a valid sample and my, my conclusions were, were warranted, what I see then is a lot, of, a lot of topics coming in every day as I do my topic modeling in WordStat that are kind of shooting up, many of which, if not most of which are highly negative, highly emotional, uh, high anxiety types of things. And I have to say that based on the evidence I see, I would say Chomsky's probably correct, right? And, and I would say that Mirlu is supported too. That it, it, it's sort of like a totalitarian <laughs> type of thing in terms of, of, of the way it operates. Now, you may come up with a counter example, right? Because we believe in Karl Popper's approach that we have to try and falsify things. We have to argue about things. We don't, we don't just do that. That's all part of science. But that anyway is John Aaron's sample, and that's what he uncovered. Okay, so that's that's item number one, and and uh, I was able to um, kind of uh, you know show I think some important concepts here. Now, Noam Chomsky is very well known, uh, and you look him up and you read some of his books on manufacturing consent and so on. He is very well known on the ideological left. Now, if I was to take also part of Chomsky's arguments and look at it from the perspective of a person who's a little bit more on the right. And let's see what that person is saying and see if we can use our sample in a similar direction, but for a slightly different thing. We would go after Chomsky's view of solidarity being torn apart, okay? So we're gonna stay with Chomsky, but we're going to kind of broaden it out a little bit more. And so for that, not only are we gonna take another example, we're gonna look at another proposition. And on this proposition, we're going to add not just likelihood ratios, but we're gonna say machine learning can also work in concert with likelihood ratios, and in many cases do the same thing. And we're gonna say that pattern recognition through machine learning can help us use automation to uncover deception within specific groupings of documents or within specific documents or interviews, right? So what I'm doing now is I'm peeling the onion. I went all the way very, very broad about the media in general, but now we can talk about specific people or we can talk about specific groupings, okay? So we're gonna take another example on this and we're gonna say, are we being subjected to military grade psyops? Let's explore that. Again, we're gonna use the, the proper view of discipline of saying that we're going to have um, a theory, we will have hypotheses, we will get samples, we will test, and we will go through that complete scientific loop. So what are we gonna use for our theory? Well, we'll take Mike Flynn, General Flynn and Boone Cutler. Flynn was a general, Boone Cutler, a sergeant in the army. So it's, it's certainly away from Chomsky's academic kind of thing further to the right. 
And the overall thesis of this is that the key US government agencies have been hijacked by globalist organizations seeking a one world government. They're using sophisticated psyops against the citizens. And one element that's mentioned in this book includes destabilization efforts to fractionalize the population and reduce solidarity. And he specifically uses the terms polarize the population, demonize the population, tribalize and dehumanize, okay? Now, how in the world would we ever test such a hypothesis, right? Well, I can tell you how I started to do it, right? And the other thing that's important is that he states, or they state, we are unaware of this, okay? So it's sort of an insidious type of thing they claim, all right? How might we test this? Well, what did I do? Well, it's a background. And I gave you background to Chomsky. I'll give you background to Flynn. Well, it turns out that if I look at the eighth and fourth Psy PSYOP divisions, mainly out of Fort Bragg, uh, they have specific PSYOP. There's specific PSYOP technologies that are used. And for instance, if I look at their website and say who we are, PSYOP forces are masters of influence. The core of information warfare, we conduct influence activities to target psychological vulnerabilities and create or intensify fissures, confusion, and doubt in adversary organizations. And, and so I'm not, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm just saying that the technology exists to do these kinds of things, right? And if they can be done in the army, they can be done by anybody, right? If you think about it. And then we've got the fourth PSYOP division, <clears throat> which is also, I believe, in Fort Bragg. And I like this phrase here with their emblem, verbum vincet, the word will conquer. So in other words, the ability to conquer through exploitation of psychological vulnerabilities. Well, that's a very, very interesting capability. And it would also be very interesting and I think quite useful to be able to um, mitigate that if, if we are subjected to it. Let me get a little drink here. So let's continue. All right, how did I, how in the world would I start to test this? Let me go through the thought process. What I did was this. I tried to find speeches of influential people in my generation, call it, and even before my generation, uh, but at least that I was aware of. Now, again, I'm no spring chicken, right? You know, so I'm going back to some things that go back to World War II and you know, even World War I that I read in history books and so on. So I took speeches by Biden, Fidel Castro, Winston Churchill, and Franklin Roosevelt, Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy, Louis Farrakhan, Joseph Goebbels, Adolf Hitler, uh, Jesse Jackson, John Kennedy, Vladimir Lenin, uh, Abraham Lincoln, George Wallace. I tried to get this wide range of people that either would be unifying or polarizing and demonizing, I thought, right? And I had a few surprises, but I ended up labeling them from a machine learning perspective based on what I found. And I took samples of speeches. So I'm not saying everything I'm showing you is projectable. It's more the methodology, right? Because I didn't spend the time I needed to make a very, very defensible argument. I'm, it's more my, my approach that, I, that I'm talking about. So I ended up labeling these, well, one, represented at least the speeches that I saw, I thought were factionalizing and zero meaning that it was not. Um, and so let's talk about this. So what did I do? I took all those speeches, I put them in WordStat, I did topic modeling, and I was able to, comp to find different topics that I thought were either unifying or polarizing. And then in particular, there were certain group or faction mentions that I thought were extremely predictive in terms of discriminating people that were, uni were, were polarizing or not. And so it kind of led to a number of words per 10K division. And that kind of, you know, if you have a familiarity with machine learning, it basically looks at separators. What separates one group from the other? And, and a lot of these words were embedded in there. So if I looked at, uh, for instance, uh, that are like shown here, uh, these, it came up with a real long list, uh, quite, a, quite a list in, in WordStat using the likelihood ratios here. Uh, they're all highly significant in terms of separating the groups, okay? So I find a lot of words. Now, one of the things when you're doing this, this is kind of based on, on, on experience here, that 
when you, you, you want to try and get the what I'll call the most parsimonious model. In other words, a separation with the fewest possible words is important. Why? Because when I tested these words against the corpus, I was getting all these false positives. So the fewer the words, the more universal the words as a discriminator between one group or another, between a good or a bad intended, right? You, uh, you know, uh, a polarizing versus a, a non-polarizing, the fewer words you get, the better, right? But there are words, right, in these speeches that came out. And if I look under unifying, well, surprisingly, all of the speakers, all the influencers had elements of unifying words, right? They all had different target audiences and they used unifying, but it was the, it was the, the separating words. The polarizing words, which really drew the, the differences between the groups, that was interesting. So what I did was uh, um, I took this to try and reduce to the slowest, smallest possible number of polarizing words, right? Because the fewer the number, the more likely it is to be generalizable to my total population. That's a very, very important concept. Um, and, and so what I did is I, I, I exported it from WordStat into Minitab using the uh, classification and regression tree using Leo Bryman's algorithm that they have there. You know, it's very, very good. And I, I was pleased to find that with just a very few words, I was able to, to discriminate the polarizing here from the non-polarizing quite well. And uh, it came out. Uh, you know, the, the statistical test shows here that uh, I got about 85% on, on, on coming out accuracy in terms of uh, coming out with both uh, in terms of the testing as well as the training set that I used and just that small number uh, that it was able to accurately predict those on just a, a small number of words. So I have a, a true positive rate is 85% and a true negative rate was 100%. And I was able to get a, a parsimonious, meaning a simple, simple few set of words. Now, uh, most of those words were related to racial type of dis uh, remarks that were made, you know, and, and there were a few others, but it was a small set of words that I was then able to apply to the corpus and, and, and to also to the, the, my daily samples. So if I look, at taking the prediction from machine weren't learning. And I was able then to label uh, each of my daily news samples from there, right? So I'm going back to my word, my, my daily news stuff, right? And I'm able then to compute these weights of evidence comparing the corpus, which at most is 5.9% had polar, was categorized as polarizing versus my daily news samples, which was 61% had polarizing mentions in it. What I see then is that this allows me then to rate my daily news samples using the weight of evidence approach that I showed you with likelihood ratios, right? And uh, I, I can see that basically looking at those daily samples, it supported Flynn's argument because I compared my daily news samples with what was in the uh, uh, the corpus. So you can see I've got kind of two two sets of hypotheses here that I was able able to compare. Okay, so now hopefully everybody kind of gets an idea of that. So the other thing that is interesting about a machine learning approach, and we're gonna we're gonna be using this next time and the time after that quite a bit. Uh, because the, the machine learning approach applies, it's, it allows automation readily, whereas the, the likelihood ratio type of thing, albeit a very, very solid hypothesis test, it's pretty manually intensive to have to go through this, right? And so, so uh, progressively, what we want to do is come up with this kind of a automation where the machine, using machine learning of the proper dictionaries that are set in WordStat, the word stat dictionaries then would apply in machine learning and then predictions and flags can be triggered to, to hit different types of deception. And so what that means then is once you train a model in machine learning, you can then apply it to other 
pieces of text that it was not trained for, right? So for instance, if I wanted to insert Donald Trump speeches or George Bush speeches or Barack Obama speeches or um, Bill Clinton speeches or anybody, right? Justin Trudeau, whatever, okay? All of those then could be related and predicted by the machine learning model as a flag. Either it's a zero or it's a one, right? You, you see how that, that would kind of work. So, so that is the, the, the kind of the overall vision, the overall approach that uh, is kind of used. So now, I guess I went a little bit faster in this presentation than I timed, but um, we have, so I went through um, three basic propositions uh, today. And, uh, you know, I have another one coming up next time, which even gets perhaps even a little more interesting because it's, it's much more subtle and much more psychological. And that is this idea of um, using likelihood ratios and machine learning to work together to uncover linguistic nuances that are found in deception, right, at the group and individual level. So what we're gonna do next time, and we'll leave with that, is we're gonna cover deception by equivocation through the use of linguistic euphemisms, okay? It's actually very, very important. And, and just to give you kind of, a, of an idea of, of where this, this kind of goes, um, is I've collected a list, for instance, of, here's my references, <clears throat> but I've collected a list of all sorts of ways that we get deceived, right? I've done a little bit of research on, uh, like I started with fear, uh, and I've, 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 I'm kind of going through all of these, these methods, right? These are not invented by me. So basically I started with this, where I'm looking at all these different methods of deception. And then uh, I'm trying to show as many examples as I can that would be applying to all of you. So I, I, I even get into bots and AI type of, of methods that's not mentioned in here, but that's plagiarism, right? I mean, you know, if you think about that, or it's just, it's deceitful, because when people start generating bots and social media, it, it makes it look like there's more people than there really are who are thinking a certain way. And that is another uh, kind of a, a measure. So, so kind of where this is going is, is, is this way, that uh, the way I kind of see this, and this is where I'd kind of like to open it up maybe for conversation if possible, is that <clears throat> what we're doing right, is that we're uncovering different ways that deception can occur. And if we follow science, they all have to go through theory, hypotheses, you know, testing and word stat, dictionary constructed, likelihood ratio, machine learning, you know, testing, deployment, and general availability. This is kind of a project management profile. Now, the ones in green are examples that I'm going to give in our three exercises. I'm gonna talk about, we've talked about fear and anxiety, polarization, and uh, we're gonna talk about equivocation through euphemisms, censorship and bias, exaggerating the desire for a new normalcy through bots and AI. We're gonna talk about bots, AI, and plagiarism, but there's still a whole host of these other areas of deception that, that could be uncovered. And so I, I think the example is, I know Normand and I had talked about this, is that we would like to kind of open this up for discussion with all of you to see if there's an interest in, um, you know, first of all, did you get anything out of this discussion? <laughs> and um, are you interested in any of the ones that are following? And, uh, you know, what direction would you like to go? And, and how much would you like to participate in this, right? So I think with that, Tony, I'm going to... Um, just, just let the the group talk, or you talk, or Norman talk, or anybody who wants to say something. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, John. Fascinating. Um, if you have questions, please use use the chat feature, and uh, we'll take as many questions as we can. Uh, this session is being recorded. Uh, we will be posting the recording on the webinar section of the Provalis Research website, so you can go and and look at the recording. Or if you have colleagues who haven't seen. Uh, we're busy doing something else and want to uh, want to see the presentation they can uh, they can go look it'll probably be posted within the next week um question john uh people are asking um about the uh, 
availability of getting this presentation. Um, of course. Okay, so can you um, share? An, do you have an email that they can uh, they can uh, use to get in touch with you? Yeah, you know what? Uh, I, yeah, John Aaron at milestoneplanning.net. You, you know that Tony? Um, yes. Uh, let let me let me type it here. Now the thing is, I would ask that you copy Tony because I don't know for what reason I wasn't getting Tony's emails yesterday. And I don't know if it's like uh, a Canada US thing or what's going on. But anyway, my email address is john.aaron at milestoneplanning.net. All right, let me extend that out. And please copy Tony, right? Because uh, I'll make sure Tony and I can confirm that he also received a request and, and we'll get it out to you. And keep in mind, I have animation in the slides. So if you just print them, uh, you know, it'll, it'll kind of overrun a little bit. So just be sensitive to that, uh, that there is animation. Did you put and that I in? Did you just put that in chat, John, your email address? <laughs> did you put it in chat? No, no, I'll try. <laughs> I don't use Zoom all that often. Okay, okay. What I'll do is, is, is I'll send out if you, if, here it be, goes. I think I think I got it. Okay, there it is. It's in chat. Perfect. So everybody, and my email address, everybody, you received it when you received the uh, the links to this webinar. You have my email address. It's uh, Tony Ross at Research dot com. So if you have any questions, please type them into chat. I'm going to throw out one here, which is John. You mentioned that you use we're using the WordStat sentiment dictionary, but yes. um, you also said that you looked at several others and you found the words that want to be better. Which ones were you looking at? Uh, it was a, an opinion one. Um, oh, what was it called? By Lou, L-I-U. Uh, I have to look that up, uh, but I did check it. And um, it, uh, it had very little variability. It was, first of all, it was a balanced sample. I'm, I'm hedging, Tony, because I'm going to have to look it up. Okay? No, that's okay. That's okay. You know, um, but it's a common one. It was an academic one, and uh, I did use it. And it was balanced uh, between same number as negative words as positive words, when in fact there are actually more negative words typically. Okay. Um, I, again, if you have questions, please fire them into the chat. When you were doing... The example, okay, here's one. The example of topic modeling on leaders' speeches was interesting. When you labeled the extracted topics as unifying or polarizing, was that done manually? It was. It was. It was. It was. It was several. It reflects several iterations. For instance, because of probably because of my background, <laughs> I assume Fidel Castro was a very, very polarizing figure. Well, but if I looked at the sam selected sample of speeches I had, he was not. Uh, I couldn't justify it. And, and, and it's because I believe their target audience, they were, they were unifying to, right? So, so to answer your question, I had to go through several iterations of looking at the actual data that, that, that started to conflict with my own prior expectation. And so based on that, then I went back and relabeled some of those things. Okay. Um, this is from John Ford. Many of you on this on this presentation might know who's also presented before. Did you make any modifications to the words type sentiment dictionary or did you use it out of the box? I tended to use it out of the box with a couple of exceptions. Uh, in that, what I did is I found that you see when I when I went in, keep in mind, I, I grabbed titles, right? Of linked, of basically news areas of linked titles. Now in some cases, I grab the HTML, and again, I use I use MATLAB for that. It's a great, it's an outstanding tool for that. I grab the HTML, and and in the HTML, there are certain words that are used, like in their their uh, URLs, you know, like slash inflation or slash whatever, you know, or not, not inflation is not a good one because that's a very powerful word, but it was it was certain words that were overused that were coming up. And it was not because of the sentiment, it was because of the syntax they were using in their HTML. And so what I had to do then was to remove those words 
uh, to do that, but there were very few words uh, that were like that. So I tried to use the sentiment dictionary right out of the box as yeah. best I could. How are you identifying double negatives? Uh, whatever, whatever that was used for the proximity rule in in the um, um, in the dictionary. It, yeah, I took it right out of there. It's okay. used there. In the, yeah, the proximity rule in the in the uh, dictionary is already taken care of. That I believe. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions. Like, here's one sort of questioning. The, okay, I'll throw it at you. Just curious, why you sure. use My Michael Flynn? For the conservative point of view, Chomsky is a noted academic, even if biased, depending on where you're coming from. Yet Flynn is uh, not all that academic. Well, it's because he wrote a book, okay. and um, I, I, that that put him in a, a area of legitimacy uh, in terms of I felt it'd be defensible to use as an example. Okay. Um, Does that answer your question? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> If, if that doesn't answer your question, you know, follow up. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm, I'm reading this just straight off. So sure. I, have many, yeah. I have many questions and thoughts, but one is about the field sector level trends that might influence anything on individuals, but is not fully a product of each, me of each media or set of media stories. There, there may be certain frames put around the meaning of something like the Ukraine war by different political groups. You got to read this yourself, John. It's, it's too, you're not going to be able to, it's, uh, it's all too right. long. All right. Let me, all right. Uh, let me tell Sk you about the Ukraine war. Um, okay. Go ahead. I'm going to be using that one in my bias example next week. Uh, I believe it's next or next time we talk next time we meet. And uh, I'm taking an example of uh, only one channel that is reporting on the Russian-Ukraine war. And I felt just in reading it, it was a case of bias. And to a great extent, what, uh, what we have to do and talk about bias as an example is maybe reference to, like, like you could argue, well, 50% of the time do they favor the Russian side versus 50% of the time do they favor the Ukraine side, right? And that's kind of the, the same way that Turing did with the Enigma machine, because as they were, they were trying to get letters, he knew that there were one out of 26 times one out of 26 letters that, that would give a probability. So it wasn't always a reference document, but it could be a reference number. Okay. And so when you're talking about bias like that with the Ukraine war, I think I can read into maybe where that person is going with that question is that. Um, it's a case of where you have to decide what does bias mean, right? And it may not be tied to another reference document like what I showed here with a corpus, okay? So maybe that gets into that, that person's question. Okay, Dev, if you want to follow up, go off mute and just ask John directly because it's too long for me to read. Um, sure, thanks very much for the presentation. It's just, um, as you uh, you clearly know uh, a great deal about the area, but one of the things is, you know, as somebody working more at a meso macro level, their framing of various things, frames are quite important for, um, you know, how media portrays things and those frames float around in a field uh, independently of any individuals or media outlet yeah. um, for a while. And I'm just wondering, do you have specific tools to capture frames, you know, within topics or measured apart from topics as covariates that you use, or are you going to talk about in four through eight uh, propositions? Well, well, I think you're, you just give me something to think about there, because I don't think I had really thought of that until you just brought it up. So it's a good observation. Are you working media? Are you? Um... Uh, we've been looking at, you know, waves of COVID in North America versus um, Asia and looking at framing of uh, COVID and using stats and a bunch of things. So, yeah. um, but we, so we have thought, you know, and we scraped all the newspaper data yeah. over the five waves and so forth. So we have thought about, you know, frame and frame analysis more at the field level, um, you know, that does inform individual likelihood of yeah. maskering or responding. So I, I, I was would, just curious. I would, yeah, yeah, I would be very interested. If you have anything written on that, I would love to consider that. Okay. I, have not, I have not thought of the term frame to be specific. 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. Just just checking just by way of seeing if our research would be directly informed by that. Yeah. Thank you. Now, now I what I have done though is I've compared like on a particular topic, I've compared multiple uh, media yeah. to, to see that. So, I mean, you know, in that regard, if, if frame is related to that, I would imagine it would be tied to, ultimately you get a regression to the mean, I guess, and you get people that go above and beyond where that would be. So that was the only way I was able to try and control for some of these things is by, by visiting multiple sources uh, to try and get that um, uh, variation out of it. Sure, sure. Well, some of you know some people use more of a Snow and Benford, and some people like that Gamson piece. You know, you would know Gamson's work being from your that background. So, um, yeah. Well, yeah, I'll I'll just send a separate email about that. Yeah, that's that'd fine. be wonderful. That's fine. I, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That'd thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Great observation. Great observation. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Uh, one more question, John. In the beginning, you mentioned an effort concerning avoiding your own biases. Yeah. In, in your approach. Can you develop a bit more on this? Was it structured or just more of an informed approach? Well, what I tried to do, you know, for instance, I kind of played out how would I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I almost like I say, this is almost for me like writing a second doctoral dissertation. Uh, I put enough. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the 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 resources and it, I'm just I, I'm, I'm I don't want to jump around too much, but if you look at what I had to do to put this together, uh, you know, I mean, what I read was a lot of dealing with sociology, psychology, statistics, linguistics, uh, forensic science, all that kind of stuff. And so I almost viewed it like it was a, I have to defend another dissertation in a way, that's the way I did it. So I tried to replay and say to myself, if I had an audience here listening to this, how would they attack me? in a good way, right? A Karl Popper kind of way. And so what I tried to do is to say, well, you know what? I created my own negative word dictionary. John Aaron did. I did this several years ago. And I, I believe Dr. Coolidge is in the audience and he knows <laughs> from, from Elmhurst University, he knows you know, that we, we, we did this at Elmhurst University. And, and uh, but it had more words than the Provolis one, but why in the world would I do that when in fact, Someone could just easily say, well, John, you're just using your own bias here, right? Use something that is independent. And the same with the weights, with the, with the topic analysis in WordStat. Those of you that know WordStat, uh, you know, when you do a topic, you export it into a dictionary and it has some assumed weights. Well, I saw the words and I, my first reaction was, well, I don't agree with those weights in some cases. But then I, I bit my tongue and I said, no, I'm inserting my own bias into this. And uh, uh, so there was a number of areas like that where it was just self-questioning, what am I doing? And it, it had to do also with, that's why I added the second example because I started out with Noam Chomsky and he's very much associated with one ideology, ideological left. And I said, well, wait a minute, maybe I need to get something more that's on the other side on this thing. And that's why I brought that other one in. And so it's everywhere I possibly could think that I could be bringing my own biases in, which I know I have, right? I try to neutralize those and mitigate those as best I could. Does that answer the question? I think so. It answers it for me anyway. Um, okay. Yes, thank you. It answers the question. Um, okay. Uh, we're, we've gone a little bit over. There's not very more, more there aren't any more questions in the queue here. So um john thank you very much thank you everybody else for listening um for participating um john will uh be doing follow up uh his second uh in in this series probably somewhere near the end of february take a look at uh our twitter feed our website um social media i'll also follow up with all of you uh, th um, through your email that you uh, which I'll I have from your registering today on the next uh, for the next event and please remind you that uh, our next our, our, our next event not featuring John but featuring Abby Jones and Sarah Oates will be on Wednesday February the 8th at uh, at 12 Eastern and look out for that and please register for that uh, just before we go John uh, final comments uh, foreshadowing um, the, the next event. Uh, leave, well, 
it's going to be more. Uh, uh, I, I think the um, you know where we where we kind of want to go is you know I, I'm going to be showing getting deeper and deeper into more specific uh, types of. Um, hold on, let me see here. Well, all right. I'm, the bar here is is blocking my ability to, to run animation. But really, what I want to show is more examples to get more and more specific to individuals, as opposed to like the general media, right? And one of the things that uh, I, I, in particular, I got feedback from um, actually a couple of my colleagues at, at Elmhurst University and my business partner too, Dale, uh, talking about the the um, use of AI. And so what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm going to be simulating some text using AI as examples to see if there's patterns in there. I'm not totally done with that. But at the same time, I know that uh, uh, you know that's a big factor. Now, I, I've done quite a bit already with it. I've got some good examples. Uh, but I'm going to do some more. And then also on some of these psychological aspects, these nuances that I think are linguistically very, very powerful. So I think it, uh, you know, today laid a framework uh, that I think you know people can follow and they can change and they can tweak and so on. But some of the other ones, I think it's going to get much more into the machine learning side and to more efficiently and more quickly pick up things and use the dictionary and 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 uh, uh, be able to export that to to come up with uh, actual models, statistical models that are uh, classification models. So those are coming. So um, I think that's 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 my vision of what's coming up. It's going to take two more two more sessions to do it. Okay, well, thank you very much, John. And by the way, I don't know if you've had time to sort of peruse the chat as uh, as as you've been going on, but uh, lots of kudos, everybody. Thank you very much. Great presentation, uh, very much appreciated. So, on behalf of us here at Provalis and everybody else, thank you very much, John. We really look forward to the to the next one, and uh, we'll be letting everybody know uh, when it is in the next uh, week or so. Okay. okay, great, Tony. All right. So, thank you. And thank you for everything you guys are doing. Your, your products are just outstanding. Wordstat is, is the best. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great rest of your day. And uh, we'll see you February 8th and, uh, and then soon after. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.